um, just to be clear on how the streaming will work, um, we are going to record the workshop itself. However, I will leave a Q&A pod at the end of it that will not be streamed for anyone who wants to ask questions off screen. Um, yeah. So when Alina gives me the cue, we can start. Yeah, we're ready. Awesome. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, so we're going to talk about today uh, analysis, basically how to do them using burdens of proof, why we want to use burdens of proof and how to do that. Um, just a quick caveat before I start, because I always have to say this, I did not invent anything on my own. Uh, there are many people to get credit for what I'm going to discuss now. Actually, a lot of the things we're going to discuss in this particular lecture is not even unique to debating, but is taught quite globally in philosophy lessons about logical, uh, like, about logics, basically. Um, but the second thing is, I also don't hold any objective truth. I'm going to give you some guidelines as to how I think and what I found useful in analysis. However, obviously, some people do it differently, and that's also fine. Awesome. What are burdens of proof? So basically, every argument has subclaims that construct it. These are the burdens of proof for the argument. The argument has to fulfill two criteria in order for us to be able to call it a standing argument. The first one is the conclusion has to be logically derived from the burdens of proof that construct it. So to give a simple example, if I say it is raining now, does it logically constitute that Jane is using an umbrella? The answer would be not necessarily. However, if A, it's raining now, and B, it is known that Jane is using an umbrella when it's raining, the logical conclusion has to be then, Jane is using an umbrella now. Now, to be clear on what I did here, this is not yet proving that any of these subclaims is true. It is very possible that it's not raining now, especially if you're in the summer in Israel and it's warm and sad. However, if the two claims are correct, it has to also conclude that the conclusion is also correct. So the first thing that an argument needs to fulfill in order to be standing is that it is logically consistent or derived from the subclaims that make it. The second criteria then is that the subclaims that make it are also true. So it has to also be raining now. So presumably now Jane is not wearing it and you're not using an umbrella. Now to connect it a bit more to debating and why is it something that is even worth doing? Because I've had multiple people sometimes ask me, why do it that way? It is so much easier to just use the good old scheme of A, why it's true, and B, why it's important. And the more you use burdens of proof, the more you're likely to actually make your argument not stand intuitively to people, because it's enough for just one burden to not stand for the whole argument to fall. The trouble is, this is true whether you use them or not. So to be clear, an argument cannot be standing if it does not fulfill its burdens. Even if you didn't bother using them, it does not prevent your opponent from picking holes in your analysis. So I will start with one intuitive example from debating. In the motion, this house would abolish maternity leave. The prime minister can come up and analyze for seven minutes why maternity leave gives employers incentives to not hire women in the first place. They could go on forever with multi-layered analysis of many reasons for this. Because the time of the maternity leave itself is time that costs money. Because this means that the, during this time, the woman is not going to have a consistent work, meaning that when she comes back to work, she's going to have to catch up on a lot of things she missed and will not be able to advance at the same way, rate as a man, etc., etc. I could go on forever and still lose to a 10 seconds rebuttal that will just say, but they can't not hire women just because they are women. It's illegal. We have anti-discrimination laws. Now, why is this important? The reason is the good or the, the level of your analysis is not directly tied to how much time you spend you spend on it. If it would be the case, you couldn't have ever judged debate because everyone talks for the same time. Seven minutes of analysis can lose the 10 seconds uh, of a rebuttal 
because they are prioritizing the wrong burdens. What essentially I did with the rebuttal that I've just given is the same. You did a lot on analyzing one burden, which is the incentives to discriminate women. You never gave a single word to explain why you are able to discriminate against women, even if you want it very, very much. At which point, the case cannot stand. So to use this example and get back to why we should use burdens of proof. Firstly, it makes our arguments more immune to rebuttals. It makes them stand and stick in a way that they cannot fall that easily. Secondly, it makes our analysis more efficient. To be clear on what I mean by that, we have discussed just now that the amount of time you invest in an argument does not necessarily determine the strength of the argument. The way to utilize your time best, and time is a scarce resource in debating, is to direct your time at the right burdens. And therefore, you can be more efficient rather than go on and on on the same burden that is not likely to be contested. Thirdly, it helps you also identify efficient rebuttals to the opposing bench. I think the most common rebuttal people use today is, that's not true. Like trying to, make, to, make, to prove the claim that what the other side said is false. I think while it's intuitive, it's not that of an efficient rebuttal quite often. If I would try to explain why maternity leave doesn't incentivize employers to not hire women, I would probably fail. It's quite an unlikely statement to make. It's quite intuitive that at least to an extent, there is some lesser of an incentive to hire women because of it. It's much more efficient if I can override this, if I don't need to directly challenge the analysis coming from the opposing side and just uh, point at the missing link that they've had. At which point I don't need to spend as much time as rebuttal as they have spent in analysis in order to win them. And lastly, it also helps us in extensions, particularly in vertical extensions. So I think the most common mistake people often do with vertical extensions and why people often lose with them is just to say, we analyzed it better, which does not help the judges understand why, why your extension is meaningful, what is different in how you did it from the, how the top half did it and why it's better. Whereas being able to look back at the burdens of proof of the argument and point at top have made very good analysis on this link, but they've missed the crucial burden that I'm going to be the first one to fulfill actually helps judges understand why your contribution is meaningful. Or in the example we just discussed, if I were CG, I would definitely extend on why employers are able to discriminate women rather than just want to do that. Other questions so far? All right, in which case, let's get to the more, yeah, just a sec, to the more complicated uh, issue of how we find burdens of proof. So the first and unfortunate thing to say is, there's no clear cut path to it. There are no rules of thumb or short ways or whatever, uh, or shortcuts. Uh, a lot of it comes through practice and through actively searching for them and trying to think what constitutes the burdens for the argument. However, there are some guidelines and some, specifically some guiding questions that help us find these burdens. The best of them, while potentially the hardest, but still the most effective, ask yourself where you would likely be challenged. If someone is likely to try and rebut your case from this angle, it is probably a burden for you to fill in. So during prep time, when you analyze your own arguments, do two things. Firstly, ask yourself, where am I likely to be challenged? Secondly, ask the help of your partner as well. How would you rebut me? Having them tell you as well where they are likely to challenge your analysis will help you identify where you need to fill in a burden. Second potential method. Uh, I think someone is unmuted. So I'm going to ask if anyone has any questions to write it in the chat, but not unmute yourself there because it might disturb the audibility of the lecture. All right. 
have a concrete headline or bottom line. Now, to explain why I mean by that and why it even has anything to do with burdens of proof. Let's take a basic argument most of us have done or perhaps overly done because it's way too popular than it should be, the black market argument. Let's say we are in a debate about legalizing all drugs and we want to make a case that there is a black market. What would be the burdens of proof for a black market argument? Does anyone have the idea of what the burdens are off the top of your head without reading through the screen? So maybe uh, the ones uh, can do this black market and uh, the other ones, the, the sellers, I mean, can do this black market and the buyers can um, and, will, and will be motivated to uh, approach this market. All right. So A, they are able to do it. The, the law is not sufficiently enforced and B, we have a motivation to go there. Question, let's say I was to rebut it and come up from a position and say, so what? If, if even a few people are going to stop buying heroin, let's say majority will still do in the black market, but just a few will stop. How much worse could, could heroin be than it already is for me to care about the black market at all? Do the burdens of proof that we just discussed cover for this rebuttal? So the answer is probably no. However, aside from doing the classic of what I just did and asking ourselves how we would have been rebutted, I'd posit that another good way to help us identify the burdens of proof of the argument is to word it differently in the first place. Black market is a very generic term that doesn't say much about why you're winning the debate. I would advise, generally, try to word a bottom line that makes your argument debate winning. If I prove this bottom line, it means I win the debate. Proving black market does not necessarily mean you win the debate. However, if we are to make a different bottom line of, say, majority of the people who consume drugs today, uh, who consume drugs uh, uh, if it's legal, still consume it when it is illegal. The only difference is now it is significantly less safe than it would have been under a regulated market. This is already a bottom line that is more likely to be one that is winning the debate if you prove it, because this already has the comparative factor in terms of majority of the people go there, in terms of this being worse than the, than the illegal market, etc., and then the legal market, sorry. Another advantage, however, of using this bottom line rather than the simple black market is that this bottom line already has within it what are our burdens. It says we need to prove that majority of the addicts will go there. It means that we need to show that drugs sold in the black market are significantly worse than the ones in the legal market and that our proposal solves it or eliminates the black market. So the key thing here is often to find our burdens of proof, we want to ask ourselves not only what is the argument, not what we need to prove for the argument to stand, but what do we need to prove for the argument to win. This also leads to the next sort of rule of thumb of two most common burdens of proof that are likely to occur in most sort of arguments. The first one is a comparative factor. Nearly every argument that has the potential to win a debate also has to have something that makes it comparative to the other side. Not just something is bad, but something is worse than on the alternative. So in this case, the fact that A, majority of the addicts still consume there, and B, the fact that it is comparatively worse than the legal drugs is the comparative factor in the argument. A second common thing that we need to have in most of our burdens for arguments is a solution. 
what often people fall on in terms of burdens of proof is a problem solution mismatch. So what also is very common when we need to find the burdens of proof for our arguments is to also show why our side of the debate solved the problem that we describe. Or in other words, in the particular example we gave, why our argument eliminates the black market. And the last thing that I'm going to caveat soon, practice makes perfect. A lot of arguments tend to repeat themselves quite a lot. For example, the black market argument that we just discussed for drugs can be used in nearly every debate that has to do with black markets. It can also work for prostitution. It can also work for organ selling. It can work for nearly everything that black markets exist for. The examples, the nuances, and the reasons that fill in the burdens as to why the burdens are correct change. The burden structure itself is usually the same for all of these sort of arguments. Meaning that if you practice a lot and just actively ask yourself in debates, what are the burdens of proof of this argument? And you learn them for many repetitive arguments, you're likely to also learn many of your cookie carters for future debates so as to save you time and remember by heart already what are the burdens of proof you need for any given argument. Now, I'm going to ask firstly if anyone has any questions so far before we are going to discuss a bit more the cookie cutters part. Um, anyone has any questions? All right. Yeah. Yeah, I had a question um, regarding the black market bottom line, uh, black market headline. Um, if the government says that the uh, there is some kind of political immunity which is aiding the black market, how would the opposition uh, rebut that case when they have political immunity? You, political immunity. You, let me see that I understand where you're going with this. You mean that even if the market is legalized, the uh, crime organizations revolving it would still stay? Um, it's like um, the people who are who are in power are uh, are near. Uh, uh, they are uh, responsible for legalizing the legalizing unofficial legalizing the black market unofficially which is uh, in the common people's term it is illegal but it is already been supported by some political leaders or something like that if they have political immunity like support from political leaders major political leaders what would the opposition say to oppose it or how do you def how do you break that uh, uh, how do you solve that problem the political immunity so the issue you're describing is that in the status quo, the black market is very efficient and continues to prosper because it has political support? Yes, uh, it's something okay. like that. So I'm not going to discuss at length during the workshop how to fill in those burdens because I think this is a slightly different topic. However, as for your question, if I were an opposition, and I would need to fill in my own burden of why the law is effective and enforceable or why we are able to prevent the black market, I would give probably several explanations around the following lines. So firstly, something about the fact that politicians are also held accountable. So saying that they have political immunity could sound a bit like a conspiracy theory in a way when we have like investigative journalism and we have other politicians with the incentive to catch anyone who is actually supportive of these black markets, etc. at which point it is much harder for them to actually be complicit. But secondly, I would say, whether they are, whether they aren't, the mere fact that there is a law in place, even if they are not enforcing it compared to the crime organizations, A, they can still enforce it as to individual people, which are not as strong in lobbyism, but B, the mere fact that it exists in itself is a deterrence. People just don't like going to the black market. It's a dodgy place, it's like undercovers and it has a lot of crime revolving it. So even if it is technically existent, I would say from opposition, people just don't go there. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. It uh, answers pretty much. Cookie cutters. Um, so to uh, give a quick explanation of what do I mean by cookie cutters, Often in debates, um, we have certain lines of analysis and like burdens of proof schemes that repeat themselves quite often. And rather than reinvent the wheel, 
we use again and again the same sheen that we are already used to. Now, I did choose, despite some people having disagreements with me about this, to practice with you some common cookie cutters in this workshop to help you with common arguments that repeat themselves a lot in debates. However, I want to be very clear on why I make this choice and why people have reservations from it, because there is also a good reason to be potentially opposed to using cookie cutters. One thing that people often repeat is, if you use the same machine again and again, if you just use what you have learned by heart rather than reinvent it by yourself, it A, makes of a bad habit, it harms your creativity, it makes you use the old things that you know rather than rethink for yourself. B, it makes the arguments potentially weaker because they're less likely to be actually adjustable to the debate because every argument, even if it is repetitive, have some different tweaks and examples and nuances uh, relative to the motion that you're having at hand currently. However, the reason why I do think cookie cutters are extremely helpful, especially for novices, is the following. What I've learned is for me at least, learning my, co my cookie cutters helps me actually be more rather than less creative. The reason for this is when I don't need at any time and you to think of how to analyze the same basic argument that I've done every time again and again, but I already had it safely. And in 30 seconds, I can tell you how to analyze the basic arguments and the basic cases for the debate. It leaves me the rest of my prep time to think of more creative ideas, to actually have more time as well as more feeling of security, knowing that I have something safe and I don't need to think of it. So I can afford myself to use this time to actually think of new things and new ideas and maybe potentially get more interesting extensions and arguments. I think for me, it was a great help in actually advancing in debates. So I made the decision out of my trust of your good judgment, and I hope you will prove me right. I trust you to use this tool as something to assist you rather than as something to replace your individual thinking. The use of cookie cutters should never be an excuse to not actually prep the debate and think for yourself how to analyze arguments. It should be there to help you understand A, how we find these sort of schemes for ourselves, but B, to give you more time to actually invest in your own creative ideas and arguments. So let's have an unsigned agreement between us that what we discussed today will be a tool for helping you rather than a tool for replacing your individual thinking. So I'll focus on three main arguments that I think repeat quite often in debates of, uh, and in most debates in general, but also in debates that are common in novice tournaments. So the first one we already discussed, it's the black market argument Basically, there are, I'd say, four basic burdens of proof for any such argument. First, the ban isn't an effective one. It does not manage to prevent the trade of the forbidden product. Secondly, majority of the consumers are not deterred by the black market and continue going there. Or, and I will say it in an asterisk, alternatively, if you can't prove the majority to still go there, you can settle for proving that the most important stakeholder does say, the most worst of addicts that we need to care about the most. Thirdly, the black market is significantly worse than the regulated one. And fourthly, the legalization will effectively abolish the black market. Are there questions on this example before we move on to the next one? All right. Next example, choice and autonomy. Choice and autonomy debates are quite common today. This would be any debate about government intervention in individual choice and any debate in which you might need to oppose or propose a patronizing policy. So anything from this house would ban smoking to this house would legalize sex work, anything about the government allowing or intervening in individual choice. Quite often in this debate, we would want to make the case that choice is something important that the government should not infringe upon, and that in this case, we want to give individuals their free choice. 
So what I suggest we'll do now to also make it practice rather than only giving you on a silver plate the cookie cutter for this argument, I'm going to give you two to three minutes to think for yourself on the burdens of proof. The way we will do this to make it more concrete, I'll give you one example of one debate and one argument for which you need to find the burdens of proof for yourself using the tool that we've learned for, uh, earlier today. Afterwards, we will review these burdens that you found and try to also draw a common line to see how we can copy this for future debates about choice and autonomy in other aspects. So, as an example, let's take the motion, this house would ban smoking, that is cigarettes. You are opposition. You want to make the argument that people should have a free right to choose if they want to smoke. Take two to three minutes, not yet to prove the argument to be standing, only to find the burdens of proof of the argument. You don't need to fill them in yet. Try to find the burdens of proof of the argument. People should have a free choice to decide to smoke cigarettes. Let's chat in two minutes from now. Okay, does anyone feel they are prepared to offer their burdens of proof for this argument? Um, I came up with a uh, couple burdens. So, uh, first one, why it is rational choice that people is uh, going that people wants to smoke and uh, he knows of all of the harms and he can decide for himself what is better for him. And then uh, even if uh, uh, some choices or is not that rational, why the harms of his choice is not going to be that large uh, that a government should abolish this uh, motion. So. That's it so far. Okay. Anyone wants to add anything to what uh, Shazim said? Uh, maybe we should explain that the people have free will as a uh, burden. Another, um, I think that uh, maybe other people will not be harmed or, or it is not important. Okay. This is actually a very important one in this particular debate, because I think if you were to try and respond to me in a debate about smoking cigarettes, what would be one of your first rebuttals to an argument about free choice of the individual? Um, 
maybe rationality of the choice will be questioned. That's, that's one, but what else? Something to do with what said you just said? Probably people would say it's not only your choice. It affects other in many ways, right? There's passive smoking. There's also the cost on the health system, etc. So presumably you're not only affecting yourself here. And that means that also part of the argument has to be why the choice has to be your own, why you are the most important stakeholder influenced by this choice rather than society as a whole. Let's try another example of a choice and autonomy argument, and then we'll try to draw conclusions for what we've discussed in both of them. So for the motion, this house would legalize um, assisted suicide. Try to think of, as government, if you want to make the argument about choice, what would be the burdens of proof that you would have for your argument? Take a minute or so. Um, excuse me, I had a question. Um, uh, did you say that assistive suicide or did you just say suicide? I, um, I didn't hear the motion properly. Assisted suicide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have several burdens, may Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the first, uh, why people struggle in status quo without this choice. Secondly, uh, why or how it is differs with uh, suicide that people make from their home or outside of this assisted suicide. Uh, uh, why this choice is going to be rational. Uh, maybe you will going through, maybe you will be going through some psychological consultations in order to make sure that you're in, uh, in fact struggling and your body is really uh, struggling. So, and why people around these people, around this person who is struggling will be relieved, I'd say. So that's it. Okay. Um, so some things here. The first thing I'd say, just the people being relieved, I think is not a burden of this particular argument. The fact that people are relieved is not a burden that helps us reach the conclusion that the individual has a, ch a free choice to do that. Okay, the free choice, yeah. So the, the free choice should be independent of the influence on others. I think if anything, what we are aiming for here is similar to what we said about the debate in the case of cigarettes to prove that the choice is your own and you are the main stakeholder influenced by it, and this is not relevant to what others would want, you should still have this free choice. We can have a separate argument that says it's better also for the individuals surrounding you, but that would be a completely different case. Um, 
one question as for the burden of it's different from suicide in home uh, this is actually an interesting one because i think it might go at the place that i wanted you to get but i wonder what you mean by how different it is what makes it different uh, because there is a lot of programs that preventing suicide like from teenagers and why because these suicides uh, are actually uh, irrational because maybe you can be under the uh, depression or etc etc and i think i would say that i, I would say in this debate that um, in our side of the house uh, these people will be going through consultations in order to make sure that they are not uh, being under depression and their rational rationality of their choice is not being questioned okay so so that so that's actually different from what i've had in mind so to be clear i think this is a potentially good argument but still a sep a different burden that has not not much to do with the particular argument that we are discussing so this is proving perhaps that the alternative of having suicides at home if insofar as they happen is worse but this does not help us yet prove that this sort of suicide is good is something that we need to support so i'd say this is a separate argument rather than a burden that is uh, connecting us to the conclusion we are trying to derive what are however additional burdens so we did have a good idea of struggling without and i think this is important because I think this is one burden that people often forget in debates about choice and autonomy, and a burden that you, for an instance, forgot when we discussed cigarettes. Often, if we want to argue people should have a right to a choice, we want to start by showing why this choice is even important, why we should care about it. Because even if we prove that it is rational, and even if we prove that it only affects you, if it can only lead to bad consequences and can't help the individual, it's hard for us to support anyone having it or wanting it, even if they are rational about it. So we often do want to start with, what is the rational reason to want this choice? What is it even good for? So I think this is a good identification of a burden here. And the second one, again, is, of course, the one about rationality. What could be other burdens in this argument? Anyone have any ideas? Okay, then I'm going to help you a bit. One of the patterns here um, that we still did forget is also the question of why is this choice being taken away from me in the status quo? I think one of the rebuttals that come often in this particular debate is the idea of if someone really wants to die very much, they will succeed in doing so. The only thing the motion does is not enabling suicide for the people who really do want it because they can do it anyway. It's making it easier and more accessible for even the people who are not so certain, for the people who might actually have a good life and the only thing currently deterring them and making them think twice of their decision is needing to do that alone. I think this is one of the common rebuttals to oppositions often give in this debate, that making it more accessible just make the choice less rational than it would have been if you are to make it alone. So another burden then is to choose that is to prove that without the motion, the choice doesn't exist. That without assisted suicide in this particular case, you can't actually put an end to your life on your own. Whether it is like for many reasons, because it's just hard, people aren't medics, they don't know what to do for this. You have uh, biological instincts to not actually try and harm yourself. People don't manage to pull the trigger when they get to this point because it has much more risks involved because you might just very badly injure yourself, etc. So to summarize both the examples we just gave, what I'd argue is most often the shame of the burdens of proof for every argument about choice and autonomy is the following just a sec first why choice in the first place or why this choice in the first place is even important or a right we should care about in the case about assisted suicide we would say probably because for many people the continuous living is active suffering in the case of cigarettes it is less intuitive of a burden, but still one that we need to fulfill. Possibly because some people just really have a very hard life and the way to get through their day to day is something that helps them actually 
feel more calm, something that helps them get with more confidence and feeling of ease to their next job interview because they have the ability to get through their stress using their cigarettes. The second burden is to show that in this particular choice, the people who are only or mostly affected are the stakeholders making the choice rather than their surroundings. Because if the choice is massively impacting the environment as well, it's harder to justify one individual making it. The third burden would be that the choice on the status quo or on the motion, if we are opposition, is harmed. That without for our side of the debate, we don't achieve this choice. And then the last burden, the choice is a free, informed, and rational choice under our side of the debate. Or in other words, what we discussed earlier about the common burden that repeats often, the side, our side of the debate solved the problem, the problem of lack of choice. Now, to be clear, this is not necessarily the order of these burdens. I'll get to soon how we choose the order of the burdens, because this actually changes quite a lot from debate to debate. But this is basically the sort of burdens that we will end up choosing with only different prioritization of them based on the notion that we have at hand. Other questions so far? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, so I have a uh, meeting and I want to know uh, how much it will be uh, this training. Maybe should I uh, uh, retask this meeting? So, I didn't, I'm, sorry, I'm not uh, sure I understood it. Uh, how long uh, will be uh, this uh, training? Oh, uh, I think we have anything between 10 and 20 more minutes. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it depends on how many questions are asked, etc. Okay, All right. thank you. Next practice and next common type of arguments to repeat often. If anyone watched, I've had a separate lecture about that specifically but message arguments. This would be any of your two common arguments that I usually don't like, but are quite common backlash arguments. This could be every debate about art or literature and the message that it gives, any debate about national symbols, statues, commem uh, commemorations, etc. Let's start with using a simple example and try to find the patterns of proof for this example. In the motion, this house, as the LGBT plus community, would cancel the pride parade. Let's say you're on Gov and you want to make the argument that pride leads to massive backlash against the community. Try and think for a couple of minutes what would be your burdens of proof for this argument.
All right, anyone has any idea for burdens of proof for this argument that they want to share? Uh, yes. <clears throat> so uh, the first one, uh, which I think uh, people have the hate to the gay community. Yeah. Um, and the second one, gay, uh, gay pride will encourage them to open this hate. I don't know how to explain this in English. Um, and uh, if we have, uh, if we if we don't have uh, this uh, gay pride, people will uh, be not uh, uh, be motivated to hate as much gay community. Yeah. Okay, so to go through, you basically said three things. Um, the first one is there are people who have a phobia against people in the LGBT community. The second one is that pride encourages this hate. And the third that under our side of the debate, they wouldn't be so motivated to hate. Um, so some quick review of this, because I think this actually gives a good example uh, to learn from. The first thing is regarding people hating the LGBT community. I would say that this is not a burden. This is not a burden for two reasons. The first one is, I don't think this one is necessary to prove the bottom line that we are aiming for. All we need to prove is that after Pride, people hate the LGBT plus community more. Whether or not they hate us in the first place is not necessarily relevant in order to prove our bottom line. We can be able to prove our bottom line without con with completely not needing to address the status quo and why, uh, why without for Pride, uh, or why regardless they would hate us anyway. I think the second thing to say on this, however, and why I don't think is a bad end, and this is why I think it's an important thing to learn from, is anyone ever likely to argue at any point in a debate that there are no homophobes out there? I think no. The answer is probably no. And I think a good thing to notice here is if something is not likely to be contested at all, uh, it usually just means that it's not a burden. You don't need to prove it. It's going to be a consensus. The second thing about pride encouraging hate, I would say this particular burden, and this is also a common thing that I notice people often make as a mistake when they make burdens of proof, it's not a burden, it's the argument. Obviously, if we prove pride encourages hate, we de facto prove pride causes a backlash towards the community because these are just two different ways of saying the same thing however this does not help us break down the bottom line that we are aiming to prove here into the sub arguments we need to prove for it this is still a very broad claim that does not help us understand what are the burdens that we need to prove in order to make this claim stand the last thing however is a good point that i think people often miss that under our side there isn't that much hate and I think this is something important that people actually often forget in arguments about backlash and, and any arguments about message in general, that we need to also show the counterfactual. That it's not just people hate because they will always hate, but that there is another way. That if we cancel pride in this particular case, people might hate less. Um, Shazim, uh, I think what you wrote in the chat, you have also an idea for your burdens as well. Shazim? Um, I just, uh, I can sort of tell it off out. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would say um, in this motion, I would briefly discuss that people maybe don't like the pride. And secondly, uh, how much people don't like uh, the pride. So explain why there is a lot of people um then why we must care about their opinions because they may influence this uh, with this bad opinion to others and then why and the comparative there is more harms if we won't abolish the pride and explain why what is our alternative and why it is better okay so i think there is a good direction here I'm only missing one burden at this point, but just to reiterate on things that I think were good in what Chazin just did. The first thing 
uh, they think was good in what you just mentioned was actually one of the last things you added, and that is the idea of harm. Why people disliking pride actually matters to us. Okay, people hate. Haters will be haters. Who cares? And I think a good thing that you need to identify here is that in any message argument or backlash argument, which is a subset of message arguments, you need to prove some sort of motivation to action. People will do something bad about it, whether they're going to use it in order to actually harm their families, if they have anyone LGBT plus in their family, whether it will be voting for bad policies, etc. I think uh, the, the, the other thing you did also was, again, mentioning the alternative that we need to show that on the counterfactual, if we don't have pride, things will be better. And then the, the reason why I think that I'm still missing a burden here is that the first thing you said, people dislike pride, is not just one burden, in my opinion. I think these are two. And in here, I'm going to help you a bit. People disliking pride is a big step towards actually proving our bottom line of the argument. But we can't go through it that easily without having two separate burdens. I can show people hate many things. Maybe they hate hypersexuality. Maybe they hate flamboyance. I don't know. I can also show that pride has many bad things within it, or things that are perceived to be bad, like the things that I've listed above. However, proving any of those separately is not proving that people hate pride. If I were just to say people dislike the hypersexuality of it, opposition could just argue, but it's not how it actually looks like. This is just how bigots often claim it to look like. Pride has so many shapes in many different places around the world, especially in more conservative communities where we care about it more. Usually pride is not that hypersexual and most of the people involved in it are just people like you and me who happen to also be LGBT plus, but just act like you would expect any human being to act and actually have breaking stereotypes. And this means that they have two separate burdens here. The first one is to prove how pride likely looks like. And then the second one would be to prove the likely interpretation of how it looks like. So the first one is why it contains elements that might be interpreted badly. And then the second one is why the likely interpretation is a bad one, why people are likely to dislike what they see. Let's try another example of a message argument and then try to draw the uh, logical conclusion of the general burdens of proof for message arguments. So as a separate example, in the motion, this house would destroy statues and national symbols that commemorate historical he national heroes that did morally abhorrent actions. You are government. You want to prove that this motion will send a message to individuals of disenfranchised communities that they are in fact welcome in their country and part of the nationality, that it will give them a feeling like they are accepted. What would be your burdens of proof? Try to take a minute and then we can chat.
All right. Anyone has any ideas for the balance of proof for the argument? I have some. So maybe first I explain why there is still the followers of this historical um, figure and why it is maybe in long term be harmful if we want to send a message that this is really bad. Secondly, uh, what the message is going to be like um, to uh, most likely when we will destroy this uh, statues, we will explain why we, we destroyed that and why it is uh, needed and why this uh, figure is really bad. And thirdly, why this message is going to be effective, like people is going to think twice about that next time, something like that. Okay, I think the burdens you did now are very good with only one thing. I think you combined two burdens into one again. But I think you have had all the different burdens that you need for the argument with only the lack of separation. So the one burden that I think is actually two is when you start by saying why there are many followers of this figure and with, if we don't do this, it will lead to many harmful things. I think these are two separate claims. The first one is on the counterfactual, we have a bad message one of continuous oppression, one of people who still support these atrocities. And then the separate claim here is what are the actions that it leads to? What is the impact? Why it's harmful? What people are likely to do with it? Be it hate crimes, be it voting in this area, uh, pattern, etc. Third bed then, which, which you said accurately, is how the message is going to look like. Like we are probably going to say things in explanation of why we are doing the thing we are doing, in order to explain people what it is. And then the last one is the likely interpretation of it. Why this is likely to be effective in actually changing minds? Why people are likely to interpret it in a way that is indicating more tolerance? So to draw a conclusion from both these examples, I deposit that message arguments broadly have four balance of proof that are repetitive quite across all different message arguments. The first one is how the message looks like the second one is what is the likely interpretation of the message, why it's likely to be good or bad or the way that we are aiming for. The third one is what is the action or the impact that this interpretation motivates, what people are likely to do about it, why it's harmful. And then lastly, the delta, or why under our side there is a different message, why are we able to solve it with the absence of this particular message. Any questions so far? All right, then the last thing I would want to discuss is prioritization of patterns. Because as we've mentioned, there are common burdens for every argument, but which is the most important burden changes from different debates. Burdens are not equal in their treatment. We need to focus more on the more important ones. How do we decide which bed is more important? So the first rule, which is the most important one. The most important burdens are the ones that are most likely to be contested. We want to focus most of our time in analyzing what is likely to be in disagreement rather than what is likely to be in agreement. Because if it's likely to be in agreement, we don't need to spend much time in order to get people convinced. It's not going to be contested, it is going to be a consensus in the debate. If it is going to be contested, we want to be very preemptive to that. What that also means is that the harder the burden is to prove, the more likely it is to be important. And that leads me to my second thing in this slide, which is actually a very important thing. I often say that debates are a lot about psychology rather than actually about intelligence. Most of us know what we need to do and just avoid doing this for psychological reasons. There is a phrase in Hebrew, I'm not sure if it's also a phrase in English, about when you, use, when you lose your wallet in the dark and choose to search for it under the flashlight, of, like under the street light, because even if you know it's not there, it's just easier, it's not dark there. This is a psychological tendency that most of us have. We tend to look for answers and to work for things where it is easiest rather than where it is most effective. Most often, the burdens that are easiest to prove are the ones that are the least important. If something is easy to prove, it usually means that it is intuitive, that it is quite clear cut why this better is true and standing. 
and if this is the case, there's really no, not much of a need to analyze it a lot. Whereas if something is actually likely to be contested, not clear cut, not trivial, this is when it becomes harder to prove it. This is where we actually need to struggle and think why it's true. And this is why most people often have this tendency to analyze in the wrong places because they instinctively run away to analyze the easier evidence rather than the more important ones. So the main thing we want to do when we prioritize burdens is to actively fight that instinct. Choose to focus on the burdens that are hardest for you. They are the most likely to be the ones that are actually controversial. And then the last thing to be said about this is consult your partner when you prioritize burdens. They can also help you. If you're not sure which is more important, ask them which would you try to contest most, which is less intuitive to you. This will also often help you find the right burden to prioritize. So just to make a quick practice of it, let's go back to the burdens that we've had above and see if we can identify which of them is more important. So, just a sec. All right. In the example of, say, pride, which of these four burdens do you think is the most important one? Maybe second? Probably the second one. It is less likely for people to contest how pride actually looks like. It will be contested, but not to a large extent. It is not likely nearly at all in this particular case for people to contest homophobia being just a bad thing, like the impact of it. The mo uh, and if you already prove that the likely interpretation is a bad one, it's also less likely for people to contest that the alternative is worse. The most important thing here is whether it's good or bad. Because if we were to think of opposition for a sec, opposition is probably going to argue that it sends a good message, that it actually leads to more acceptance, that people see good depictions of the community there. And I think then the most important burden is why it's likely to be a bad interpretation. At the previous example, if we take the example of smoking, this house would ban cigarettes. Which do you think is the most important burden? I guess the third one, the choice is harmed under the motion of status quo because different status quo will lead to different conclusions or impacts. Really, I think actually that if we are opposition to this house would ban uh, smoking cigarettes, it's not likely to be contested that the motion harms the choice. Like probably government is going to concede that when we ban cigarettes, there's less choice. So I actually don't think this is the most likely to be contested one. Which do you think is more likely to be the one that people are not going to agree with us about? Maybe the fourth one, that the choice is free because uh, we have uh, science and uh, scientists are saying there yeah. are many logical. Yeah, stuff. I think the, the one that is most likely to be contested here, like all other three can be contested to an extent, but at the end of the day, it is likely that the stakeholder that will end up being most important in the debate that, that government also cares about most is the individual that is smoking. And presumably government is going to concede that smoking has at least some advantages to the individual. They've just argued that they are undermined compared to the harms. The most important burden here is to prove that this is likely a choice that we can make in a way that will not make us regret, that it is not just a result of addiction and we being teenagers that are under social pressure, but that we actually make this choice in a free manner. And lastly, in the case of the black market, say in the motion of this house would legalize all drugs, which of the fair burdens do you think is most likely to be contested? Well, maybe the last one, yep, contested. What, the legalization? Yeah. The last one, I guess, the legalization will abolish the black market that is most likely to be contested. I'm not sure about that. Um, like, I think it is likely to be contested to an extent, but it is quite plausible that there's going to be an agreement that what, once it is legal, there's going to be a legal way to purchase it. 
that it is going to have some of an ability to actually buy regulated things under a like government acknowledged system like a sort of a, of a like coffee shop or whatever and that you won't be forced to go to the black market so i think it is going to be contested to an extent what is more likely however to maybe be challenged by the opposing side try to think what would be the constructive case of opposition what the, what is the advantage that opposition is probably going to argue that we get from not legalizing drugs and from them being illegal i guess the third one so I'd say a combination of the second and the third. So presumably, opposition is going to mostly argue that we prevent some people from doing drugs, and drugs are pretty bad. So we'd rather have them not do them at all, even if the people who do do them do it in the black market. So as opposition, I would focus probably mostly on arguing why a majority of consumers are deterred by it. We are probably going to be able to prevent at least a lot of the, of the population from getting drugs. And then secondly, that drugs are just bad enough for us to not care about the black market. Um, so the key, uh, the key take out of this is think what you would focus on if you were opposition. What is most directly clashing their case and their stance in the debate? And this is likely to be the more important burdens in your arguments. Are there questions as a whole? Um, I had a question uh, regarding the cookie cutter um, because I did not really understand totally what uh, a cookie cutter is and how to mechanize it. I didn't. I did not really understand it properly. A, a cookie cutter is not like a specific sort of argument, but rather just a term that we use in debates for when you have arguments that repeat a lot and they have similar burdens repeated so the, we usually call them cookie cutters it's not a type of arguments it's just when there is a type of argument it is a cookie cutter argument are there any other questions <laughs>